Welcome to the Logistics of Logistics, a podcast dedicated to exploring how things get places and the people who get them there. We'll talk with logistics and supply chain leaders about innovation, industry trends, and the future of the logistics business. Now, here's your host, Joe Lynch. Hey, everybody, this is Joe Lynch. Welcome to my podcast. Today, I'm joined by my good friend, Mike Ebrill. Mike, say hello. Hello, everybody. Joe, thanks for having me. Thank you so much. So today, we're going to talk with Mike about a holistic approach to freight savings. So before we get into that, Mike, please introduce yourself and your company. Hi, my name is Mike Eberl, and I'm with Custom Modal. Where are you guys located? We're located in Marshfield, Wisconsin. Is that the Marshfield metropolitan area or just right in Marshfield? We are right downtown, <laughs> across from the movie theater, if you're in the neighborhood and want to drop in. <laughs> so before we get started, I've got to tell you, I, I met Mike, I don't know, three or four years ago, I think, Mike. And I think I did some work for Mike, maybe some marketing stuff. And then we got together and we worked on this project for some sort of national distribution and I was very impressed with Mike, and boy, did we work hard to get that account. And I felt like we did such a good job of educating them and bringing so much value, and then not getting the business. I don't know if it ever hit. What I don't know whatever happened to that business, <laughs> but nonetheless, didn't get the business. But I did get to keep uh, Mike as a, a friend and comrade, and I was super impressed with what he did. And I, I should also say this: uh, I'm assuming those guys went out of business because that's what happens when you don't work with Mike and me. <laughs> I agree with you. I don't know whatever happened to him either, Joe. <laughs> That's one of those accounts. So, <laughs> Mike, before we get started into the holistic approach to freight savings, tell us a little bit about your background. Where'd you grow up? Where'd you go to school? What'd you study in college? So I grew up mostly in Madison, Wisconsin. Spent most of my uh, formative years, middle school, high school, and then went off to the big uh, Stevens Point, which is in northern Wisconsin, started at the UW of Stevens Point in the forestry program, of all things. Two years into that, I had an epiphany that uh, business was really where I wanted to be. So I transferred down to the UW Madison and finished up with a major in finance, investment and banking. And jumping around. <laughs> jumping around, yeah. <laughs> So um, are you threw me off on that? That was yesterday. <laughs> so uh, what was your first job in logistics after you got out of school? My first job in logistics, it turns out, was at an airport. I uh, originally came on board as a accountant for an on-demand air charter operator that was flying executives and, and high priority freight and did that for 10 years, progressing through and finishing as general manager. And I didn't know that was logistics at the time. I thought it was finance. Uh, yeah, it's funny. There's the lines always been blurred, hasn't it? Certainly. So when did you start your own company? April 2nd of 2000, exactly 19 years ago today, Joe. Oh, happy anniversary. <laughs> Thank you. I hope you got yourself a big check. Uh, still waiting. <laughs> so who were your first customers when you first started your business? And what was, who were you going after? You know, we were uh, we were primarily in the expedite business, and we were targeting manufacturers of all sizes who were running just-in-time inventory systems that were pretty much made some intermediary component in somebody else's just-in-time inventory system, and that's who we got. We got mostly manufacturers of all sizes. So, were you asset based, or are you uh, not asset based? When I started, I was a hundred percent asset based. The old fashioned model where we owned all the trucks and employed all the drivers as company employees. Oh, wow. So that brings us kind of up to the, to the topic of at hand today, the holistic approach to freight savings. And, and Mike, I know you're not a hundred percent asset based now these days, but we'll get more into that in a minute. On this topic of a holistic approach to freight savings, I wanted to talk to you about it because I know you have this approach that you and your team use at Custom Modal, and I was hoping you could describe that process to my audience. Sure. Love to. Our holistic approach is deep engagement with our customers, Joe. You know, most transportation providers, they'll come in and they'll, they'll give you a lower freight rate. Well, They'll do that through negotiations with carriers. They'll find cheaper carriers. They'll move modes. They'll do volume discounts. 
And we do all those things too, but that's just a jumping off point with us. We like to dig deeper and get into the savings that can come from process change, the savings that can come from really finding where the disconnects are in a company, the bottlenecks, and then aligning all those interests within the company so that hidden savings are found and and captured. So this is why you call it the holistic approach because you're looking at the whole company. So you mentioned earlier that you, you you had trucks and then you you've transitioned away from having all assets. And tell us a little bit about what your current model that you're using now. Yeah, you know, starting in 2000, we uh, with assets, we had fantastic growth. I mean, we went from four to nearly a hundred trucks in the space of a couple of years. Open terminals in a handful of cities and. Along the way, we opened a little brokerage and that little brokerage had kind of a different pitch to it than the trucking company. If you're in the asset business, your pitch is essentially, you know, I have trucks that go from A to B. Here's my price. Do you have any freight? And in the the brokerage business, we, we started to get more into tell us what your problems are, tell us what your needs are, and let us go source that solution for you. And that was really attractive to me. I enjoyed that part of the business even more than the asset side. Yeah, it's hard to grow both. You have to kind of choose, you know, it's, if you chase two rabbits, you catch neither. So you chose to go chase the brokerage rabbit. So, yeah, we couldn't, we couldn't give our non-asset side the agnosticness, so to say, that it needed. It's too easy when you have a brokerage and an asset side for them to automatically fill your own trucks. and. That wasn't the mission that I envisioned for our brokerage and logistics business. Yeah, it's it's always a challenge when you're selling non-asset based, and I, I've, I that's my background. And you call on somebody, and they say, "Oh, do you have your own? Do you have your own trucks?" And you say, "No," and they're like, "Oh, okay, I'm not interested." And I'm thinking, "Well, wait a sec. You've got hundreds of loads that you're doing in a month, and you're asking if I have a truck. Even if I had trucks, I couldn't do all your business with." even five, 600 trucks. So it's always kind of like, what do you expect from me? (laughs) Oh, I hear you. I hear you. So people have this, I think a lot of shippers and supply chain people have this false sense of security. If I own the trucks, that life is going to be perfect for you. But even if you own the trucks, you still have issues covering all the lanes you need to cover. So (laughs) anyway, Mike, circling back to this holistic approach. So you mentioned that you're engaging with the whole organization. Explain who you're engaging with. Well, we engage with a whole series of levels within the company cross-functionally. So we deal with the sales side, the operations and production. We deal with purchasing, finance and accounting, supply chain, and oftentimes the (laughs) C-level. Wow. So, yeah, and I think the traditional brokers, kind of some of the larger companies, they're kind of chasing that transactional freight where they've got, you know, lots of guys making phone calls and lots of carriers in their network, which I'm sure you have lots of carriers in your network, but they don't want to get into that level of detail. Their focus is more, let me move all your transactional freight. And I don't want to have to visit. <laughs> I don't want to have to get involved with purchasing or supply chain or finance. The exact opposite of what we like to do with customers. And you know you're right that there's a lot of transactional operators in our business and what's disappearing quickly is what we refer to in house as radical competency where you've got a deep knowledge and and customers can take advantage of that knowledge. Right. So how did you guys come about this? I know you owned your own trucks and obviously that gave you a, a view of that world. How did you end up with this more holistic approach to engaging? So moving from the air freight industry into the asset-based trucking industry, doing expedite and full truckload, and then becoming involved with the small package business and zone skipping. You know, I got to see a lot of different parts of the industry, both dialing in when I was dealing with accounting and operations, and then pulling back to that high level to deal with uh, supply chain people and C-level people. It really gave me the opportunity to kind of knit together lots of different perspectives. And that allowed me to start to see shippers differently. 
I came around and adopted more of a supply chain value stream mentality before I knew what that was. <laughs> yeah, exactly. That, Mike, when we talked about it while we were prepping for the podcast, I mentioned that you're kind of one of uh, an order to cash guy and order to cash, sometimes called lean, whatever you want to call it, is looking f- you know, upstream to see what the bottlenecks are, what the problems are. And, and you're engaging with every single group trying to understand what their problems are. And that's what we I was a value stream facilitator for a number of years. And that's what we did. We would map the process and walk the process and look for the non-value add, look for the look for the screw ups. Isn't that fun? (laughs) It sure is. Well, I guess based on I mean, you came to this naturally that you and your team in that you had kind of real varied background. And so it made a lot more sense. You kind of been there, done that, got the hat. So why not use that advantage? Agreed. So, you know, and and even today, most of the people in the brokerage and logistics industry have not been on the other side of the table where they're operating the trucks. I, I know what the trucks do. I know all the tricks of the trade. We'll get right back to the podcast in just a moment. If you sell transportation or logistics services, the Logistics of Logistics can help you sell more. Our customized program will help you understand your sales personality, including your strengths and blind spots get more sales leads, and improve your communication and salesmanship. We can also position you as a recognized industry expert and help you reach your target audience. To learn more, visit thelogisticsoflogistics.com. And now, back to the show. So let's talk specifically about the op- the different groups you work with. So you mentioned production or manufacturing operations. What do you get into when you talk to those guys? What are the typical value adds that you discover? You know, one of the biggest places we spend time with the operations and production people is on communication. There's a there's typically a big disconnect between production and shipping. And that comes to roost in release times. You know, everybody starts out with one release time a day, and it's usually at the very end of the day. And, you know, they still expect that shipping can get everything ordered and picked up today when they don't release the orders till three o'clock in the afternoon. And that's just one example. Right. And and Mike, and that, that driver time has become even more premium with the ELD restrictions that we've got now. And we can't keep wasting drivers time and and we can't keep assuming that the driver parked his truck 500 yards away from uh, (laughs) your customer. We got to give them the notice that they need to uh, do their job. Exactly. Well, if customers had the availability of trucks right around the corner that everybody seems to think, it would cost a fortune. <laughs> yeah, clearly. It's expensive enough. All right. So what do you do? So when you bump into supply chain managers, what do you guys talk about with them? Well, with supply chain managers, it's a much higher level conversation. Supply chain managers are about order to cash, cycle time, and the trade-offs that are involved. The trade-offs between speed or money or inventory. We did a project recently with a client that was shipping a product outbound, and it was incurring a higher than average damage rate. And so the, the, the task was, obviously, it needs more packaging, Mike. How much more packaging? How much is it going to cost me? And what's that damage rate going to change to? So that from this spectrum of options, I can make a choice as a supply chain manager about how much more I want to spend on packaging per unit to achieve a lower damage rate or accept a damage rate. Interesting. So I know there's a lot of overlap between the two jobs, but between supply chain and purchasing. But what, when you bump into purchasing agents, what kind of value can you add to those guys? You know, for purchasing agents, visibility seems to be something we bump into a lot. A lot of companies are still using a more old fashioned, they place the order and expect the vendor to just ship it. Well, that's wonderful, but there's no visibility when the vendor ships it on their own truck. You don't have any idea when it's coming. You don't know if it's running late. None of that. And that, that's, a, that's a potential problem in production. So we help them find a way to get better visibility. So you guys are using your TMS to manage inbound shipments to your customers? Absolutely. How could you operate without a TMS today? Yeah, it's it's interesting to me. I always think if I ran an assembly plant or a manufacturing plant, I would want that TMS to have every inbound shipment to me 
not necessarily to save the money. I mean, the money is obviously everyone's got a budget. Everyone wants to save money. But I would just love the idea that all my shipments are coming and I can see them all in the TMS as opposed to, yeah, I've got everybody sending it every which way and I have no visibility and no knowledge of, you know, how it's being shipped. And for really savvy clients, we do integrations so that they don't even have to look in our TMS. It all uploads into their platform whether they're running SAP or Epicor or whatever it is. I like integrations. I've, when I was selling transportation services, everyone talked about wanting integration, but very few actually wanted to spend the money and actually spend the time to do it. Which would be crazy. <laughs> but we always said, yes, we can do that for you. But, you know, that's a rapidly evolving part of our industry. A lot has changed in the last five years. It's going to continue to really bloom over the next five years. Oh, absolutely. So how about finance? What do you guys, what do you do for the finance guys? Finance people tend to be about information and we run into a lot of custom reports and customized information requests there. One of the more common examples that we see is they request a unbilled shipments report on the first of every month so that they can make their accrual entry and have proper accounting on everything up to what was shipped on the last minute of the last day of each month, even though they may not get the invoice for a week or two. Oh, yeah, that makes sense. So, and I guess they're always interested in what you're going to save them too, I imagine. (laughs) Um, That they are. um, (laughs) So what about the sales function? I know you told me when we were prepping that you're always surprised by how much value you guys can add for the sales group. You know, sales is a tough job out there in the world. And those salespeople are leveraging their credibility on behalf of their companies all the time. And, you know, they make a promise on the very front end of of, uh, the manufacturing process with a lot of variables in it. And so they get hammered when stuff is late. And it may not be late because of shipping, it may be late because of problems in production or back orders on the inbound materials, but it all seems to roost or come home in the shipping leg because they were the last guys to hold the ball. Exactly. And so we do a lot of uh, communication and alignment of expectations because salespeople appreciate being able to manage their customer expectation. And once shipping understands how useful that is to sales and the terminology that's needed for sales, it becomes much easier for that salesperson to pick up the phone, call their customer and say, hey, we got a couple options here. You know, we can expedite this to still make the deadline. Or if you can live with it a day or two late, you know, at least you know it's on the way. Yeah. And depending on the industry, you can lose sales because of bad logistics. You typically don't win business because of logistics, but you can definitely lose business because of logistics. So the sales guys, I imagine, are pretty aware of the ramifications of late shipments or damaged shipments. They are. And most of them will tell you that it's not even about whether it's late. It's about the expectation. Exactly. So, Mike, all these groups, I can definitely see the value. I understand what we're calling holistic and good stuff. In my experience, it's not always easy to get these kind of guys to work with you. How do you convince these different groups to work with you and your team? Well, it's certainly easiest if we have a sponsor at the C-level general management to the company because their support can get everybody on board and get us over that initial hump. Because once we start the conversations, the value flows and it's easy for people to see. It's just, it's that very beginning piece where you need some help getting the buy-in. Yeah. And Mike, we talked about this in our prep that you need that strong, visible sponsor and who says, we're doing this, give this, these guys your full support. And I think it also kind of requires you to go and sell every one of these groups that, Hey, there's a change. We're going to start working with you. What do you need from me? And kind of almost selling each group separately and getting their buy-in. Otherwise, you know, there's little things that can go wrong. We call we talk about it being malicious compliance, where <laughs> officially they're on board, but unofficially really don't want you to work out. And that's never fun for anybody. So you're right. It, it's easiest if if that sponsor can help pave the way. But then it's an individual discovery with each one of these groups. Because they all have different issues or problems that, you know, the silos that we have in these companies, they aren't talking amongst themselves about the issues related to freight. And 
that's what we do. We help break down some of those silos, proliferate the communication across the different functions, and align the expectations. So, Mike, we talked about getting the CEO uh, or the president or the owner or whoever involved. You sometimes need to coach those guys so make sure they say the right thing. So when you get there, there's the right level of buy-in and they've introduced you in a very positive way as opposed to a negative. Absolutely. When we do an implementation, we have a full-blown template for the implementation steps. And one of those steps is even talking points for the sponsor. <laughs> Imagine that you learned your lesson along the way. So, Mike, thank you so much for taking the time to share some of your expertise. I really like your approach, and I think I'm sure your customers do too. So, before we wrap this up for today, what's new over at Custom Modal? Well, thanks for asking. Our our latest service that we brought out uh, just at the first of the year we call Optics, and it's a parcel management service specifically targeting small parcel management and the negotiating of contract rates and audit of all of the service invoices. It's a big data application, Joe. You know, you get hundreds, if not thousands of invoices a year from the small parcel operators. And it's not, uh, it's not practical to audit their invoices on a manual labor basis. So we, we built a system that uses big data and it uh, runs in the background, audits every single invoice against 39 points. So the most common issue found is that the audit indicates a discrepancy between the service ordered and the service provided. You might have ordered a two-day, delivered in three, invoiced for a two-day service. We automatically collect the free shipment, so to say, that you should have had by not meeting the two-day requirement. Yeah, Mike, what you're describing is absolutely what the market needs. I don't think I go one day now without somebody saying something about small parcel, whether it's even industrial and distribution customers who don't necessarily ship to homes. They're still always looking for a better solution to small parcel. We have these great TMS out there and they don't, not all of them integrate properly or at all with the small parcel. And I think the small parcel companies, the big two, you know, they, they rule the roost. And I feel like we need some better solutions when it comes to the technology. Well, I agree with you. And that's why we built this product. And it's, uh, it's getting tremendous response out in the marketplace. Finding that about 4.2% of all invoices are incorrect, which doesn't sound like a lot. But you think about how many invoices there are over the course of a year. And it's a tremendous amount of money. Oh, yeah. I've been a part of uh, that auditing and there's a lot of money left on the table when people don't audit. And there's typically there was not a lot of good ways to do the audit. So it's cool that you guys got a new tool that does that. Well, and then the data that, that we gather from that turns around. And this is the beauty of it, Joe. We use that same data against the carrier when we negotiate because that's been an asymmetrical negotiation up till now where they held all the data. Ah, I see. <laughs> yeah, there, it would be an advantage. Hey, data is the new gold, right? You got well, it. Mike, thank you so much for sharing your knowledge with my audience. It's been really great, and I appreciate taking the time. Thank you, Joe. Appreciate it. You've been listening to the Logistics of Logistics podcast, where we engage in conversations with experts in the logistics field. If you're an expert and would like to be featured on the Logistics of Logistics podcast, please email Joe Lynch at joe at the logisticsoflogistics.com. 